among us, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Let the Spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the Spirit of the Lord among us, let the freedom of the King rise among us, let it rise, oh, let it rise, oh, let it rise, let the glory of the Lord rise among us, let the glory of the Lord Rise among us, let the praises of the King rise among us, let it rise, oh, let it rise, oh, let it rise. Let the songs of the Lord rise among us. Let the song of the Lord rise among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Hallelujah. Let the Spirit of the Lord Let the spirit of the Lord rise among us. Let the freedom of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh. Nothing like a good old oh, 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 <laughs> to get that soul and spirit of you to rise right up and praise Jesus. Amen. Thank the Lord for the spirit of worship that's in the house with us here today. Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray and dedicate this service to the Lord and thank him for his presence. Fathers, we worship you in the spirit of truth. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for being present among us, Father. We thank you, Lord, that there are none so free as those who enjoy the liberty that comes with the King of glory. Who is this King of glory? Amen. The Lord of righteousness is his name. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for being among us this day and bless those who have come to partake of you. May they drink of the living water of which once tasted you never thirst again. Father, we thank you, dear Lord, for being near to us. We thank you for being our God. Father, in you we commit all our trust. We just thank you for your presence this day and remembering those that uh, have needs, Father God, recovery issues, Father God, uh, some have suffered loss. Lord, we thank you, Father, that the Comforter has come and lifted us up. In Jesus' name, we just thank you, Lord, for all these blessings. Through that blessed name, the name of Jesus in which we pray, amen, amen. Well, thank the Lord. Well, let's let our light shine, shall we? Be spiritual. Let your light shine.
That's how Abraham found the presence of the Mighty One, amen, the Eternal One, uh, the, the God of uh, the Alpha and Omega promise, thank the Lord. All the heroes of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, they moved out by faith. So we thank the Lord that we can do the same, amen. amen. Thank the Lord, amen. There are examples, but amen, they were followers of Jesus just as we are. So, amen, we worship the same God. The God of truth. Amen. You may be seated this time. Amen. Thank the Lord. The praises just continue on. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Bill's going to come forward and thank the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Brother Ryan. God bless everyone this evening. Amen. It's good to be here. We'll get right into the selections, and our first selection will be Beautiful Words. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty, teach me faith and duty, beautiful words. Wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Christ the blessed words to all, wonderful words of life. Sinnerless to the loving call, Wonderful words of life, all so freely given, wooing us to heaven. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words. Wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call. Wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all. Wonderful words of life. Jesus only Savior. Sanctified forever, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen. God bless you, Billy. 
Kevin, Brother Orville, Sister Miriam. For our next selection, we will sing a group special, When We All Get to Heaven. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> what a day that will be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come on, let's get it all up here. There aren't that many. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Thank the Lord. Hold on, here we go. <coughs> Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to
God bless you, sisters and brothers. And for our next selection, Sister Patty will sing for us, Living Water. Beautiful. Sister Patty, God bless you for that. And for our last selection, we'll have a group special, Lord, I Need You. Lord, I 
Amen. God bless your brothers and sisters. And if we'll all stand before Pastor Ryan comes to bring forth the word of truth unto us, we will sing, Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. our pathway. Amen. Amen. Sister Miriam plays through. We'll bow our heads and thank the Lord for his presence among us. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the oil and the lamps that keeps us burning until the day dawns, till the day star arises in our hearts. For in the great and terrible day of prophecy, the light will shine, Father God. It will dispel all the darkness. At evening time, it shall be light in Jesus' name. So, Father, we thank you for all these great and precious promises that keep our pathway lit in Jesus' name. That give us the eyes to see, Father God. We just thank you, Lord, for being our protector and being beside us every step of the way. In Jesus' name, we give you all the glory, honor, and praise, for it is due you as we worship your name, the name of Jesus in which we trust. Amen and amen. Well, glory to God. Thank the Lord. Bless his holy name now and forevermore. Amen. Thank the Lord. You may be seated. Well, bless the Lord. Amen. Truly he is good to us. We thank the Lord for another day along the pathway of life where we can reach up to him, thank the Lord, and find his presence in the eternal glory of his word. Thank the Lord that he is amongst us, that he never leaves nor forsakes us, but is our ever-present help in time of need. So, so thank the Lord for it. And thank the Lord for the word of witness that comes through songs as many blessings go out to those who uphold the name of Jesus and who love his word, love his name. So uh, bless the Lord that he's with us, certainly. Amen. In uh, power, as we keep looking toward the promises of God that certainly cannot fail, like the old gospel standard, uh, as we sing it sometimes. Amen. Thank the Lord. Promises of God that cannot fail as we listen to the Spirit's call. As uh, we know of, of some certainties in this life, amen, one is that uh, the impossibility with God that exists 
within the Almighty. Uh, the only impossibility he, know, impossibility he knows is that of being untruthful, as uh, the truth that he is is self-existent, and it's alive because truth lives of itself. Even the spirit of truth that's there in St. John, uh, chapter 14, verse 17, thank the Lord, we, as we now come to the fulfillment of all the grand design, and we're speaking a little to it under our title. We do in all titles, but uh, for today, it's heaven and power, and this would be part two of that. There's a thank the Lord that there's life ahead, and there are pleasures forevermore. As Psalm 16 and verse 11 declares, as old things are gone, all things made new by promise. And uh, when that blessed moment comes, and it will, well, then it'll be home at last, cares all past in Jesus' name, which is not my promise, it's the Lord's promise. So, and other glorious will be said. Glor glorious things will be spoken of thee, O city of God, the city four square that comes down from heaven as a bride adorned, uh, the city of peace that is better than the old one, which is so fought over right now, uh, that's seen so much bloodshed, where also our Lord was crucified, albeit outside the city walls, but it was there in, in Jerusalem. And uh, the old city of Jerusalem, it, uh, again, uh, we hearken to it uh, in brief this morning. It will become the center of wickedness and oppression because of the calamity of the latter days. Amen. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 8, becomes uh, Sodom and Egypt spiritually speaking, in the great falling away. There have been many fallings away from the word of God during the course of history, but this one will be above and beyond all that's ever been seen before. This will be the great falling away. But out of all that, there will be a cleansing and there will be a victory. So we'll speak to this subject, heaven in power, the second part as we number them. So heaven. Can an unseen place be real? Well, there's a lot of comments out there floating around in that respect. In our day and age, more than ever, it's always been that way to a degree from the doubters of the world, amen. But in our day and age, the, uh, the microphones, so to speak, of this world are so greatly uh, multiplied as everybody's got a platform via the World Wide Web get their opinions and their voice out there. Now, some of that's good. We're using it ourselves uh, for these services. But uh, there's an awful lot of unbelief that comes to the fore out there and a lot of poison tongue that speak untruths. So, uh, to that fact of heaven, can an unseen place, can it be real? Well, our universe is held together by a lot of unseen forces. One of them is gravity. Nobody really can pin it down where it comes from or what it does, although you can see the effects of it. Uh, it's thought in this universe that most of uh, what the universe is composed of and the space between universes is composed of dark matter, which theoretically is some undiscovered uh, particle that uh, ju just hasn't, science hasn't come up with its composition yet. And uh, there can, there's other factors at work and, and so forth, and I certainly don't know all the physics that holds all the universe in place. Uh, but I have a spiritual explanation for it. God holds it all together. Amen. God holds it all together. Amen. And I'm sure there are rules and natural laws set in place that God knows and he uses. I'm sure, that's, I'm sure there's science to it all. But who, who drew up the equation? Who put it on the blackboard? Who put it uh, on, into the blueprint of glory? The great scientist, mathematician, artisan of creation, he did all the measuring and brought it all forth and brought it all to be. There in Job chapter 38, 5. Who laid the measures thereof? Who held the measuring line? Or the, you know, we say tape measure in modern English. But who held the measuring line in their hands and apportioned it all out. Someone did that work. 
Someone did that work to bring life to be, and if the Shakespearean question is to be or not to be, well then the gospel answer is certainly let there be light and life in Jesus' name. Let, let there be, amen. That's the spiritual answer, and that's good. Let it all come forth as a result of a plan and of a call, as life and awareness is at the heart of all that God does. And all the power of the name is put forward to accomplish that which is in the divine makeup of the Almighty God. It's for his glory, for he is the personification of, of all truth and righteousness. And when we worship, we are actually worshiping truth itself. We're truth seekers. Nobody should be a bigger truth seeker than a Christian. Amen. Of what truth are we afraid? God is truth. Amen. So uh, thank the Lord. Uh, So we worship truth itself, but more than just truth, just as a mere concept, because truth has life to it. It has a person to it. And the existence of God is proof of that. And the scriptures bear witness. Amen. And truth has power to it. And by that heavenly power, we draw breath. When Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches, he also said this, but without me, that being true, ever true, the vine, or what we would now refer to as the trunk of the tree, it supports all the branches. I am the vine, you are the branches. And went on to say, but without me, you can do nothing, because he is the vine. He supports all else. He's the trunk there of the tree of life. Amen. And you can't do anything without him. And that includes breathing. He is the vine that supports all else. He put the breath of life into Adam. As the man, was the, he was the first of his kind. Yes, there was creation before that. The serpent's race that could speak and walk upright there in the Garden of Eden. There was that which was before Adam, but Adam was the first of his kind because God put the breath of life into him and he became a living soul. Amen. And everything depends upon he in whom we live and breathe and move and we have our being as Paul affirmed on Mars Hill. And that needs to be constantly proclaimed to get that point across, to get, uh, in order to fortify ourselves, keep strong in our faith, and of course to encourage and edify others until we all get to heaven. And then what a day of rejoicing that will be. And uh, God is not slack concerning that promise. It took many thousands of years for the first coming uh, to be realized, and then one day there was a birth in Bethlehem. And people counted as long years and, you know, 2,000 years, which is uh, an eye blink in the uh, timing of Almighty God to he who knows no constraints of time. And one day it it will be. It'll be the day of his appearing. So uh, those things come forth and they're promised and they will be done according to his will, not by our preconceived ideas unless those ideas come from the gospel. Amen and are the truth. So thank the Lord. So we're reaching unto the place prepared, which Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if it were not so, I wouldn't have told you it was. And the eternal land, that's the place, we read it this morning, uh, where that's where mortality is conquered. We read it out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Death gets swallowed up in victory. The tears get wiped away, as John wrote on the Isle of Patmos in the book of Revelation. So we have to seek that vision to become part of it. You have to have a willing heart. And there's nothing greater, there's nothing better that we can do with our lives. No greater mission exists. And in point of fact, this, really, this is the only mission there is. Uh, you can have pursue other interests and uh, all those things are within, can be within God's will as long as you keep him number one in your heart and all your ways and your doings. Uh, other things can be done, but uh, all things great and glorious come under the heading of this mission, the mission of the Messiah. So, uh, and apart from that, nothing has any existence. 
Nothing has any meaning. And what we go through right now, our light affliction, which sometimes doesn't seem so light, it certainly didn't seem light in the New Testament era when they suffered such persecution. It didn't look like light affliction on the cross, but it was just for a moment and for the here and the now, only for this moment, but then something prepared and ordained and predestinated comes. And it's, it's the only way to go. Anything else is just the religion of hopelessness. Yeah, sure, you can go and be an atheist or, or what is more common than atheism is just being a God hater. You can do all those things. Uh, but that's not the way to life. There's only death that way. And as Peter once said there amongst the apostles, he said, well, you know, where could we go? You know, as Jesus, imagine, you know, as incredible as this sounds, there were people who left Jesus. Now, every church, including ours, we've had people who've worshiped with us and then taken different directions and so forth along the way. But can you imagine having that on your spiritual resume? That you were the one that turned away from Jesus? So if they left Christ, well, they'll, they'll leave us. But uh, these things will happen along uh, the way. But Peter said to him, well, where could we go? You've got the words of eternal life. Amen. So we have to keep our hearts set on the word of God because there's life in there. The words of eternal life are in his word, and that's what we know of a truth. And this is a more sure word of faith, as it, it is dead to doubts, like the song. just doesn't leave any room for doubt. So doubt your doubts, have faith in your faith. Brother Jack used to say that from the pulpit. Amen. And then we keep our sights set above, because there's meaning to it all in Christ the Lord. There's a promise to it all. And there is a fulfillment. In Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, as we read there, there's an existence and a consciousness of awareness after the mortal frame gives way. And we'll attest to that through scripture and our scriptural readings. And it's evident from the start. Now that just has to be. I know there were the biblical Sadducees who say there's no resurrection. Uh, boy, what was their deal anyway? Uh, you know, how did they come by that? Because from the very beginning, from the Garden of Eden, it shows that Abel's blood cried out from the ground. Now, how is such a thing possible? And that was written in their law, the books of Moses. Uh, how could Abel's blood cry out from the ground if there was no consciousness and awareness that follows this life? So it's there from the beginning. And I've seen biblical critiques that say there's uh, nothing witnessing of life after death written in scripture, to which I say, hooey, yeah. which is not a King James term, but uh, bless the Lord, it gets the point across. That's all a bunch of hooey. There's life there and that more abundantly through the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So there has to be a power that emanates from somewhere in order to give a life-giving source. So to establish the scripture that there is more than meets the natural eye when it comes to life. We read from Mark 9, we are gonna go up the mount here. We're gonna climb Mount Transfiguration from Mark 9, the first verse. And he said unto them, verily I say unto you that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Some standing right there till they see the kingdom. Now that's a, that's a resurrection statement. It's also referring to what is gonna happen. As Peter and James and John, will read it in the next verse, uh, go up the Mount of Transfiguration and they will get an evidence of that power. But, it, but it's all here, amen. There's some, how, how would you like to know? That's like when Daniel, in Daniel chapter nine, when he read out of the, the words of the decree that came from the prophet Jeremiah, it's contained within Jeremiah 25, 11, that 70 years would be accomplished in Babylon, and then the return would come when they'd go back and they'd once again own land and, the, uh, and be in the land of their fathers and build up the temple and become a nation again. And he realized he was only a couple years from it. 
How would you like to have that statement made? There are some here that will not taste of death till they see rapturing power come forth. Now, that's in the Lord's hands. I, I don't know the day nor the hour, uh, but thank the Lord for the hope of it that's within and the scripture that brings forth life through what is written. The it is written word brings a victory. It should, what, a hope of, the hope should just bubble up in our hearts and it should be a wellspring of life when we read these words, that some will not taste of death till they see the kingdom coming with power. A little bit of heaven, a whole lot of heaven with power come forth here. All right, and then following. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John, the inner circle of the 12, even within the 12 apostles. I, I often wonder, is this the moment where Judas, was this the breaking point for him? When he found out about this incident later, when the darkness welled up within his soul. We get tested and tried in, in a lot of different ways. And all the comings and goings of this life and all the things and the, the rising up and the laying down and, and the picking up or the casting away, we get tested in a lot of ways. Your pride gets tested and uh, the vanities of the soul will get tried to the utmost in order to do what? To bring out what's within. Uh, it could be this moment, and there, there it, it was no doubt a lot of moments, but I wonder if this was one of them, because he felt excluded. All right, Peter, James, and John, but he was included on so much else. Uh, the Lord withholds no good thing from those that walk uprightly. Amen. But this is uh, the instances that happened at that time. And lead, takes the three and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves and the others it, it may be largely because they were on their missionary missions and and so forth and their various tasks at hand but here it was peter james and john all right we pick it up from there and he was trans transfigured before them or changed changed before them something happened and his raiment became shining exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. Uh, a fuller was a professional laundry person of the time, amen. And in that day and age, couldn't get garments this white. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus, amen. Well, bless the Lord. There's a a, there's resurrection there. Moses and Elias, their, their presence was there. There's a, a miracle there. And the, what was within the master there? Well, there was a visible evidence of light. There was light within the master, even as he is truth and life. It was changed. His body was just a physical body. Not, well, maybe just isn't the right way to phrase it. His body was like unto ours. It was flesh and bone and uh, blood and muscle and all those things just as ours. So, it, it, you know, being uh, upon the cross and having nails pierce his hands and a spear thrust in his side, it, that, this was spiritual awareness. Uh, the body was in all ways like ours, except at this moment, when the spiritual light shone through, which was that Jesus' uh, will that it be done, amen. Here in these uh, blessings that come through the red letter statements of the king uh, concerning the kingdom to come, amen. Thank the Lord, there's light there. We know that there's spiritual light there and Jesus let it show. Let it show right at that time in order that there would be shown the victory over death and sin as God desires us to live forever, but not live to, uh, forever in a sinful state. That's why the blood had to be shed. Yeah. Amen. Uh, so uh, we weren't meant to be eternally sinful. Something had to be done. Love would have to prove itself, and the light would show here, and the resurrection power would come forth because that's a resurrection statement as well as a showing of the light. The kingdom of God comes with power, amen. So it's the power promised and it's seen to them as evidence. So thank the Lord. 
So miracle here, amen, Moses and Elias, it, it's beyond natural understanding, so in that sense, it's a miracle. But to God, amen, this is what God does, amen. This is just normal, <laughs> if you can use that word, if you understand my meaning, for an eternal one who is truth itself, who knows no boundaries of space or time, who has no limitations, this is just the normal state of being. And the light there that was within him, well, that's strong evidence that, there, again, there's something beyond the confines of the physical as we know it. With the light of transfiguration, uh, thank the Lord. But it's the, power, it's the power that brought it all about. Amen. All power is given unto him. Out of Matthew 28, we'll read that too. But thank the Lord, all power is his, and it brought it all about. And where there is the power, miracles follow. Amen. And God understands them. Uh, you can't understand miracles necessarily with a microscope uh, or uh, an x-ray machine. But thank the Lord, you can see results of those things. But the powers of the Almighty God and the miracle of it all that underlies all else, at the root of every miracle, there is, of course, the power to do so, heavenly power. It's here. And the power brought forth the two prophets of old, showed the light was there, which in turn, in eventuality, that light would dispel the darkness of the tomb. And although I know no scripture records it, what the mo actual moment of resurrection was like, I find it hard to believe that it was dark in that tomb at the moment of resurrection. I think there was light, glorious light. The Lord knows, however it was accomplished, in, in that moment, that's withheld from our sight. But what we do know is resurrection life came forth there. Amen. 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 So, what meets? Heaven and earth meet here. For God has the power in heaven and in earth. Heaven and earth meet right here. Miracles from heaven meet in the earthly realm. And the power is present to call forth to bring them out of what was called Abraham's bosom, again, in the story of Lazarus and the rich man, as every level of heaven is called into being by the voice of God Almighty. Again, as stated earlier today, in my Father's house there are many mansions. There are many places to walk, many levels. Thank the Lord. So we praise God that these things exist, and it encourages us along the way. In Genesis chapter 49, I want to go back to the book of beginnings. This will be Jacob Israel's blessings of his sons who become the tribes of Israel. Does truth exist? You know, that's a, that's a philosophical question, needs answering. Does truth exist? If truth eternally exists, then there has to be a record of it given to us by the spirit of truth. I don't believe in a God of ignorance, amen? He wants you to know things, he reveals things. Where else is that record of evidence recorded other than in our scriptures? That's evidence that he's alive, for we are alive. And that's proof that living truth exists. And the Bible's that, it's the record, it's the journal, of all that came about, all that has life. And it tells us how all things came about and it has a destination. And scientists, you know, and so forth, and how they interpret the Bible, that, uh, that's, that's just, you know, they're just shooting from uh, the hip, so to speak, and their deliberations and so forth, have no real revelation light on how to interpret it. All right. But thank the Lord, we have a, have a destination in Christ. And this portion of scripture, we're going to read from verse 29 to the end of Genesis 49. What of the soul, what happens when the earthly tabernacle is dissolved? All right, insight is given to this from the account, once again, of Jacob Israel and his passing, who knew his time was drawing near to this moment. And we read from the 29th verse of Jacob, who was called Israel because he prevailed with God. And he charged them, speaking to his sons, 
and said unto them, I am to be gathered unto my people. Is there life in that statement? Amen. Yes, there is. I am to be gathered unto my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre in the land of Canaan. If you remember in Abraham's history, bought the cave there. Which Abraham bought with the field of Ephron the Hittite for a possession of a burying place. There they buried Abraham and Sarah, his wife. There they buried Isaac and Rebekah, his wife. And there I buried Leah, one of the mothers of the tribes of Israel. Verse 32, the purchase of the field and of the cave that is therein was from the children of Heth. And when Jacob had made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into the bed, yielded up the ghost. See, there's something in there, you know. Ghost in modern English, we often use it, you know, for spooky things and so forth like that. King James Version just uses, uses it to represent the spirit, the soul that's contained within. So yielded up his spirit and was gathered unto his people, which is a spiritual designation. So uh, the reading of all the verses helps set up the, the framework to read the last of these verses where he's gathered up unto his people. And accordingly, he knows that that's uh, what's happening. Gathered to his people in verse 29. Knew that was forthcoming. All right. So there's a link to heaven that is ex contained here in the twice repeated phrase of being gathered unto his people. There's more here than just the meaning that would be in the sense of uh, being buried in the same place. That happens in the next chapter. There's a real break between where we have segmented chapters 49 and uh, chapter 50. Uh, the translators of the King James Bible, uh, they followed the course of the Geneva Bible, which was the first Bible, Bible of Shakespeare, it's the one the pilgrims brought to the to the New World when they landed there at Plymouth Rock. Uh, that predates the King James Bible by about uh, 60 years or so, 50, 60 years. That was the first Bible that had chapter and verse, and for the most part they did a remarkable job, and the King James followed that, and uh, a good job was done here because there's something much different that happens in chapter 50 because that speaks of the actual death and the embalming process and so forth. So it's not dealing with that. So gathered to my people means something spiritual, not physical. That all comes as you read the whole context of chapter 50. So there's a link to life forever in the name of the Lord, in the name of Jehovah God El Shaddai at this point in history. So uh, we're looking above for our definitions and we're not looking from below. It's more here than meets the eye and there's more here than just going the way of one's ancestors just the, that process of death. There's life here. He's going to be gathered to his people. There's a gathering going on there. Amen. 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 For being gathered to his people, it's treated as a separate issue. So we learn that this gathering unto, it means more than being put in the family plot. That's mentioned here, the burial place that Abraham bought where Abraham and Sarah were buried and so forth. Uh, ex exists now as a place of veneration in a tourist site, you know, when it comes to that point being visited. Uh, they're in the burial place of the patriarchs there, so uh, in, in Israel. So, but this means more. This means more. Amen. There's a difference between the heavenly soul and the earthly body. Heaven and power is going to bring it out. And the preparation and the embalming process, that's all in chapter 50. But the gathering unto his people, amen, uh, thank the Lord that's put in place there. For those of us who lost ones, they've had to move on to the other side of the river. They've crossed over from this life. What's that process? It's a gathering unto your people. As many experiences, you know, what's called near-death experiences, or some that experience actual clinical death, uh, a lot of them have been uh, spoken in terms of where one comes in contact with 
with those who have gone on before. Uh, Brother Branham had a notable one. Uh, as you know, the story of his life, his wife and his daughter. Uh, he had a very notable experience like that on the other side of the curtain of time because there is a, another experience that goes on on the opposite shore from this one. And how do you know all this is certain? Well, does truth exist? <laughs> If truth exists, it's got, to have, it's got to have a source. It's got to be somewhere. Where do you find that? Where do you find that? I find it, uh, if you look for the source of it all, you have to come to this place where you come to the Bible. As each person within, it, it's built into our structure, our spiritual being. I don't know how all the science works. I know how the faith works. I know that God creates, he orders it and brings it all forth. Each, but each person has a unique signature built into themselves. Uh, science sometimes calls it a wave function. Uh, God knows the secrets of the universe and how all these things work out. So there's a signal, kind of a, a homing beacon that draws us near unto those of our own people that puts us in the presence and the light of the Almighty God for which that gives us an eternal hope. Let's look to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20, we'll get right to the source of all knowledge and wisdom and the sayings of the master from Luke 20, and we'll start at verse 34. Now, the, the subject matter spoken of, it's kind of a, a different than our subject matter, but there's a principle within that applies. So I'll read the account here. This is after the questioning of Jesus and the example is given of a the seven husbands who die, you know, and whose wife will she be in, in heaven and so forth. We'll pick it up. Of course, they were just trying to entangle him in, in uh, minor points of doctrine so they'd have reason to accuse him. But Jesus answers in verse 34. And Jesus answering said unto them, The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world in the resurrection from the dead. See, there's, there's life forevermore. No, oh, there's power to get you into heaven. They obtain the resurrection. They neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die anymore. Oh, there's the power of an endless life. They, all that walking through the valley of shadow of death, they did it once, but they're not anymore. They can't die anymore, for they are equal unto the angels in that respect. In respect of power, angels are a greater creation than we are. But in this respect that, they have, that we have eternal life as they do, we're equal unto the angels. And are the children of God being the children of the resurrection? Now we're coming to the, the point of all this. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed it the bush, uh, the burning bush where he received his commission, when he calleth the Lord God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto them. Amen. That answer being arrived at by the question is whose wife and the resurrection and so forth. The power of life to conquer death and hell shows through the words of Jesus. Is there such a thing as heaven? I think we can remove all doubt here. Heaven is where life is. Amen. Thank the Lord. He's not a God of the dead, but of, of the living. So is there such a thing as heaven? Jesus said so, drawing from the calling out of Moses from the burning bush, when Jehovah God, El Shaddai, spoke of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but he spoke of them in a way as if he knew them, as if they were present at, at the moment, as if they were living souls right now. He spake of them in present living tense. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's who I am. And God is not the God of the dead, but the living. So he spoke of them as if they were alive, as if he knew them, which he did, <laughs> which he did, amen. He didn't speak of them as if they were dead, like as if they were just some dry historical fact. 
God's not out there playing trivial pursuit. He's speaking as the living God. Amen. He didn't speak of them as if they didn't exist, as if uh, speaking of them in historical terms only. He's the God of the living. That's his witness. So there's more to come. He spoke of those patriarchs in the right now sense as of living people in immediate terms. So, so here's a statement. This is one for the books. There are no dead people in heaven. <laughs> Amen. Doesn't exist. There, there are no dead people in heaven. There are only living souls. Amen. And they are as alive as live can be. In Jesus' name. Now, sometimes in the immediate sense, yes, the Bible speaks in terms of of the physical aspect, but there's life in heaven and there's nothing but life there. There are no graves in heaven. There's no one buried six feet under streets of gold in heaven, amen. They're all up there walking around on top in the glorious light of his presence, amen. That's a gift that's given of the Almighty, life and nothing but life. And yes, Solomon did say, uh, in his writings. The dead know nothing. Uh, They don't know anything and uh, they don't have any more reward. But that's why we compare scripture to scripture. We don't isolate scriptures. We compare them to other scriptures to get the balance of the whole thing, to get the double witness doctrine moving, eh, that out of the mouth of two or three witnesses in that interpretation, let everything be established. So by that, you see that Solomon was only speaking in the immediate context of the physical realm, of this existence. The dead don't know anything in this existence, but they're not dead. Amen. They're alive in Christ. They're alive in Christ. Uh, When you go to Revelation under the fifth seal, there there are souls under the altar there. They sure think they're alive. They, They sure know something, don't they? And they want to know something. They want to know this. How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not avenge our blood on them that dwell on earth? So there's awareness of existence, amen, to what level God knows. But it's there and it's plain from all evidence of Scripture. So then we, being children of the resurrection, as inheritors of life, even though the body perishes, We become as equal to the angels in in the respect of life itself. We live to die no more that way. Made eternal by the power of the limitless God. Now what could be more heavenly than that? We need the vision of it to keep hope alive. To make it real and active. To make it a vital force that has power in order to change our lives in the here and now. Has power to do that as the Almighty did not place a measure of faith within the heart of each and every person just to see, see it go unrealized, to see it go uh, inert, without effect, without growth that leads to the blessed spiritual harvest that is coming. Now that measure of faith that God implanted, you know, it doesn't show up in each and every person. You know, there are famous names in history and and, uh, you know, there are people that make news headlines for a day and so forth. Uh, there's, you can see that there's not much eternal life in that person. But think on this. Who is it, no matter who they are, who cannot believe in the heart and confess with the mouth that Jesus is Lord and receive salvation? Every person on the face of the earth can do that. From the beginning right down through the corridors of time. Now, uh, plainly, some reject that call. Some even come to hate it and, and reject it utterly and uh, destroy the faith that God implanted. But each person has that measure to reach salvation faith, just belief and a confession, and that, that's it, simple. Just that, just that simple. And the faith of Jesus can grow therein, but some turn aside from it. There's no question about that through their their choices. Amen. But God gave everyone the ability to do that. Everybody can do that, no matter what name you name. But the ability to obtain life is always there. Let's go to Hebrews. 
This will be the last chapter of Hebrews, Hebrews 13. Explanation to the Hebrews there in those early church generations when the church and the synagogue were splitting apart from one another over the question of who this Jesus is as we're just sharing some wide-ranging thoughts on heaven and about life itself. If the word comes to pass, as it always does, then isn't the, uh, the, the rest of the witness that's contained within Scripture, isn't that verified? It all brings itself to pass. Or, or, or is God only the God of partial truths? Hey, he hit a few. How would you like to serve a God that hits a 9 out of 10? That's a 900 batting average. Pretty good, huh? Nah, but it's not holy, is it? Because as James chapter 2, verse 10 says, if you transgress even one uh, part of the law, you've transgressed the whole thing. So if, so if Jesus only hit on 9 of 10, he would have transgressed the, the whole thing. So to be holy and righteous, he had to be 100%. So there's 100% assurance, amen, within Christ. And hol as holiness, it demands complete truth. Otherwise, the angel witness in Revelation 4, 8 wouldn't have much to it, saying, holy, holy is he who was and is and is to come. Has to be 100%. Has to be without fail. All right, here in Hebrews 13, uh, the, that portion of Scripture that tells us love has to continue in the first verse, but we're going to read, picking it up from verse 12, which says, Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood. Sanctify. Take something that's not holy and turn it into something that is. Something that's not fit to be in the presence of the Almighty God and make it so that it can stand in the day of judgment. That's what the blood, of, that changes things. That's the transfiguration of the soul. It changes the soul, amen, that's bent on destruction into something glorious that can be a vessel meet for use. Good to every purpose at hand in the Almighty God. He changed the people. He sanctified them with his own blood, suffered without the gate or outside the, the gates, the city gates of Jerusalem at the crucifixion. On Golgotha's Hill in the Aramaic at Calvary, Latin translation of Golgotha, there outside the city walls. All right. Let us go forth, therefore, unto him without the camp, or outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one, which is, we seek one to come. By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Amen. Well, that's what we do. Praise is the point of all things. There are the quiet, contemplative moments where you, you're still and just know that he is God. And then there are times for the shout of acclamation. There's times to welcome him in as the king, as it was there on the Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That was the time for the shout of acclamation. And then uh, the thinking on God's word, it's always time to do that. Amen. So the sacrifice of our praise, amen, the fruit of our lips, gives thanks to his name. And the continuing city, that's a vision of surpassing beauty. We see it in the book of Revelation. We hearken to it a little bit. In the morning service uh, to its spiritual foundations, the new Jerusalem, new heavens, new earth, the spiritual foundations of it that are contained within Psalms chapter 50 as being the very perfection of beauty. It's there in all its descriptions. And, and, and the that lends beauty to the faith that's contained within the Word of God. It's meant to do that. It, it's like music. You know, we have the beauty of the melody. What's that do? It's not the actual faith itself, but it lends beauty to the faith that's contained within the song. It enhances it. It shows you, it brings it to life. It brings it up within your spirit. So these visions, amen, they're there to enhance the beauty of God's truth. It does that. His beauty is in glorious truth. 
just in the same way that a melody beautifies the worship of a song. But the, the point of the song is always the faith that's contained within the song. That's always central. I'd rather uh, sing a song that was off tune and have faith in it than sing a song that had no faith in it, but it was, you know, it charmed the birds right out of the trees. Which is better, amen. It's better to have the faith within there. But thank the, thank the Lord for both, because the beauty enhances the wisdom and the faith contained within the words. All right, so there's a little bit of heaven in all these scriptures lending beauty to them as it sanctifies them in these sanctified sayings as we seek that which is to come. And it's all there to get you right down to the life, the birth and the life, and the death, the sacrifice, and the resurrection of one person, one moment in time, as truth exists, and since there can only be one eternal truth, well, it follows that there can only be one God. And this is the way and the truth and the life of it. There, uh, there can't be two different sources of truths. That just, uh, it cannot be. One tree is life and the other is uh, the coming in of evil. Knowledge, okay, you already got the good, now I'll show you evil. Uh, there can't be two sources of good or two sources of truth. All right, there can only be one, and it's all there within our spiritual grasp, as life is within our spiritual grasp, when we confess his name, believe in the heart, and it's designed to be so by that one God who set the table before us in order to get us to one place in time. Whether you were there at the moment, whether you look back at it uh, through the lens of scripture, or whether you were looking ahead to it uh, prophetically, amen, it's all meant to get every person on this earth together in one place, one moment of time, under one banner. Amen. Thank the Lord. Under the banner of Jehovah Nissi, God is our banner. Amen. And heaven is his promise. And the promise lives on in, in a continual place. We don't have one here. This is the life we're born into. It's a life we know. We get accustomed to the things that we, uh, the circumstances we grew up in, and those circumstances so rapidly change because of the advancement of the sciences and, and so forth. Uh, but we don't have a continual place here. One day we'll fly away. When I fly away, I want to sing, Oh Glory. I want to leave it all behind. Amen. Thank the Lord. I want to be gathered to my own people. People of faith, that God brings faith together too. The faith signature, the faith wave function, that's going to bring us all together too. Amen. Into a glorious place. And then we'll see the lights that are really our home. And let's go to the words of the Master. I promised this a bit, or referred to it a, a bit earlier. Promised to read it. Matthew chapter 28, finish out the book of the witness of Matthew, one of the original of the twelve. When the real power of revelation strikes down deep within the soul, then you can see heaven from afar, from this worldly plane, by eyes of faith. And it doesn't take so much. After all, what is the Lord required of thee? Just a little acknowledgement, a little desire for true justice, love mercy, have some meekness of spirit. What do the meek do? They inherit the earth all the promises of God's blessings. Just it takes a little walking humbly with the ever-abiding spirit. As God doesn't require any sacrifices at, in terms of what the law of Moses entailed. He doesn't require any more sacrifices like that, except that of a willing and a humble, contrite spirit. They offer up sacrifices of praise. Christ made the sacrifice. He did that. He made the one sacrifice for us to be our redemption. So just accept that one. And he's shown the effect of it. He showed it there to John the Apostle Revelator upon the Isle of Patmos. He showed the effect of this type of spirit, uh, one that uh, has no guile as Nathaniel of St. John chapter 1 there. Jesus, remember, he said, here comes the Israelite with no guile. And boy, there were a lot of them that had 
guile by the bucket loads in the day of Jesus' witness, looking to accuse him and, and so forth, finally did put him to the cross. But here's a, a, an Israelite with no false purpose. You know what you're going to see, Nathaniel? You're going to see heaven open. You're going to see angels ascend and descending upon the Son of Man. Now that's heaven for sure. That's heaven. Oh, yes. Yes, that is heaven. What comes down from above is greater than that which ascends also. And heaven's not so far away as people want to think in general terms. I, I know the whole world, it's, it's far removed from the heart of God. But God's not so very far away in this respect that his word is nigh thee. Even in thy mouth, when you speak it thusly, when it's confessed, and in him we're alive. We move on his word, which shows that we have life within us, and his presence is near. That's what his name meant by promise, his promise name. In other words, what the effect of his name would be. In the Emmanuel promise, Emmanuel, our God is with us. That is who Christ would be. So here in Matthew 28, amen, thank the Lord. We thank the Lord of, for that which the God does require, amen. Because those uh, few things that we follow, those spiritual directions that we take, that puts us in a place where uh, Micah the prophet, he expressed this. When I sit in darkness, even the Lord shall be a light unto me. He's a light that shines in the darkness. And God's word, that's the brightness. That's the brightness that shines all the more out of the darkness, which cannot comprehend such light, as uh, the opening verses of St. John chapter 1 tell us. All right, Matthew 28 from verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Yeah. It's his. Yeah. All the power. Yeah. All of it, I think all of it, I'm interpreting that to mean all of it. <laughs> all the power of Jesus' name. All the power in heaven and earth. I think that means what it says. I think that says what it means. All power, all heavenly power is given me. Go ye therefore. Here's the encouraging word. Amen. What you do is going to have effect. So go ye therefore. And teach all nations, and here you are. You're out of the nations, the kindreds, tribes, and tongues of the earth. Here we are as a result of these things being spoken. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the world. Amen. It's done, it's a finished work, it's true and it's certain, it's yea and amen, it always was, it always will be. It is right now and it cannot fail, it cannot fall short of its promise. And when you say amen, you're saying all that with four letters, amen. For God is the great amen himself, amen. So that's where the power of heaven is within Christ, a risen Christ. So baptize them in the name of Jesus. What's Acts 2.38 say? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. Which is baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Because Father is not a name. It says baptize them in the name. He who holds the crowns. Son is not a name. It's a crown. Father is not a name. It's a title. Holy Ghost not a name. It's a title. It's a surrounding glory of power. Jesus is the name. Jesus is the name of which is held within all the power that there is in the world which is now, the world which is to come, the fullness of the Godhead bodily is contained within him. That's what Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 tells us. And then within him is all the power in heaven and earth. Let's stand in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for those that are standing on the promises. We're going to sing. There's a gathering going on following prayer of dismissal. If there are any that need to take communion yet or those that wish to take it again, there's no rule concerning that.
but uh, elements of uh, communion, remembrance of the Lord, his body broken, his blood shed are available for any that need communion. But uh, we're going to pray here and thank the Lord for the, the gathering together of faith. Thank the Lord. The scriptures are all gathered together into one book. If God can do that, can he gather all the people together in one place? Where they sing the new song, amen. Where they're glorified by the name of Jesus. Thank the Lord. He can do those things. Amen. He gathered the stars together to be a witness unto those that look heavenward in Jesus' name. So we thank the Lord for those that uh, are blessed by his name. As we bow our heads and pray as Sister Patty and Sister Miriam play through the gathering going on. Father, we do thank you for your presence. We're thankful that we have a name. We thank, we're thankful that we have the name of Jesus in which we can rely. When all else fails, amen, you're our stay. You're our solid rock. Father, we just thank you, dear Lord, that our house is built upon the rock that cannot fail. When all the powers of death and doubt and fear, when they assail, amen, we will be standing. We'll still be standing on that promise. So, Father, we just thank you for life and that more abundantly through the name of Jesus. As well, we thank you, Father God, for this service, for those that have worshipped therein, who have given their most earnest praise unto the Lord of glory. Father, we pray that they are highly blessed. And for those that are bearing up under the, uh, the burdens right now, Father, we just thank you for victory in Jesus' name. We thank you for the word that says, speak it only and my servant shall be healed. We thank you for the comfort that you are in Christ. Father, we bless your holy name now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, glory to God in the highest. Thank the Lord. There is a gathering going on. Well, there's a gathering going on, and I know it can be long. And we hear the call from heaven. Children gather round my throne. Many souls of every race are being saved by God's grace. From heaven, children gather round my throne. Many souls of every race are being saved by God's grace. Look around, it can't be long. There's a gathering going on. There's a gathering going on. And I know it can't be long. Till we hear the call from heaven, children gather round my throne. Many souls of every race are being saved by God's grace. Look around, it can't be long. There's a gathering going on. Look around, it can't be long. There's a gathering going on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Stretch forth your hand. King. 
Yeah. 